Graham Stewart is Conservative MP for Beverley and Holderness. Mary Cray, former Labour MP for Wakefield and former chair of the Environment Audit Committee. And George Eaton, senior editor at The New Statesman. The lines are open for your questions 0345 6060 973. You can text your question to 84850 and you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first questioner. It's Simon in Southampton. Simon, hi. Good evening. Boris Johnson, to me, is nothing more than a terrible case of political constipation. And today I feel like the laxative I've finally chosen is going to start to work. And the relief when it shifts is going to be incredible. So the question is, is Boris Johnson at the moment nothing more than a caretaker prime minister? Wow, well, that was an interesting way of putting it, wasn't it? Um, George Eaton, let's start with you. I wouldn't call him a caretaker prime minister, actually, because that term to me implies someone who's just there on a interim basis. I think Boris Johnson, the reason he's survived to date, I think, is because he's the prime minister who delivered Brexit. He won an 80-seat majority. I think that has earned him the loyalty of some Conservative no, MPs. By the way, George, never say Brexit to Simon in Southampton. <laughs> it, it triggers him. So, <laughs> But what I think he is increasingly, though, is a prime minister whose moral reputation has been shattered. I mean, it's fair to say the Conservative Party knew Boris Johnson was not uh, the most trustworthy of, uh, of MPs, but I think his, his reputation has, has sunk ever further, and I think it probably is more likely than not that he won't lead the party into the next election now. Well, he, of course, said to Beth Rigby on the plane to India that that's exactly what he will be doing. So uh, we will see. Um, Graham Stewart, uh, you've been presumably in the Commons today witnessing all the d different speeches in that debate. What, uh, first of all, answer the question from Simon in Southampton, is Boris Johnson now nothing more than a caretaker PM? Then just give us a bit of insight into what you... Because you, you've seen a few Tory leaders come and go, haven't you? I have indeed. Um, but uh, Boris is, uh, is an unusual um, Prime Minister, an unusual leader, and anyone who's ever bet against him is typically lost. So uh, the left is crowing with this idea that they've weakened him sufficiently, that he's not going to be able to lead the party into the... Well, next he is election. weakened, isn't he? Um, he's had a, uh, a troubled period uh, with this, but uh, the focus on Partygate, when there are so many other things going on, I mean, and, you know, I could rattle through the various big calls which he's got right. I mean, we we had the fastest vaccination um, uh, rate in Europe. We've got more antivirals than any other European country. In Ukraine, we've got uh, not only a personal chemistry with their heroic president, but recognition both by the Ukrainians and indeed by the Russians of the particular leadership and special role played by the UK led by Boris Johnson. If Boris Johnson hadn't been the prime minister uh, and hadn't, alongside Ben Wallace as the defence secretary, hadn't lent in ahead of the... Um, uh, of the eventual invasion, um, what would the West's response have been? Would it have been as strong as it has been, not just by the UK but by others? I think he's, uh, Boris Johnson's played a truly influential role and uh, has also, of course, seen us through economically. But what, what do you say to the likes way. of David Davis, your constituency neighbour, William Ragg, Mark Harper, uh, Steve Baker today? And these are all serious people. They're not they're not just the usual suspects, are they? When you hear what they have to say, what, what do you say to them when you see them in the tea room? Um, well, I, I think that uh, the Prime Minister is continuing to do a good job. And I think uh, uh, as long as he keeps making the big calls right, then he's going to continue to have my backing and that of the vast majority of Tory MPs. Then, you know, the... Uh, because uh, we should say he sacked you as a minister, didn't he? So yeah, he you've did. got no reason to be particularly no, I, loyal I, I, to him. No, he's, no, no. He, Salt he, in the wounds he, there. He, 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 <laughs> sorry, but I mean... He's not coming on the programme again. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, well, I have to come on after Ian so uh, uh, unselfishly came up to Beverly and then had some horrendous uh, oh, electric let's, journey let's back. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Um, Whole trains. Mary Cray. Is he a caretaker prime minister? Well, I think he's a dead man walking. Um, when you've got 80% of the population that think you're a liar, I don't see how you can stay on as prime minister. And whether we're talking about him deliberately misleading parliament or misleading parliament, that is just how many angels can stand on, on a pin. It's, it's over. 
and it, it started being over in January. He's lasted longer than anyone, including on his own side, believed was possible. And I think running away to India um, is a strategic Running away? He's mistake. on a trade mission. He's well, doing his uh, job. Announced, well, it's, uh, is he? Um, I yeah. think this is a big distraction. I think it's a big and it mistake. It wasn't organised the day before. It, it's been in the it diary for, for some time, has hasn't it? it? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So, well, I'm assuming it has. Well, well, we've been working on our relationship with India. I was a trade minister, um, and uh, it's you know growing very quickly. I don't it's think it's enormously business as significant. usual. No, and, uh, I don't think it's a business as usual. I think it's a desperate attempt to move the story on, as was the Rwanda refugee policy, as was the <laughs> uh, you know the briefings from the 1922 committee last night. But when you've got people like Tobias Elwood saying it's time to stop drinking the Kool-Aid. I think for everyone who's brave to enough fair, to I'm not put, sure he ever has drunk the Boris Kool-Aid. No. Well, no, that's fair <laughs> enough. But, you know, people, as you say, the people that you've quoted, um, I don't think uh, for each one of those, there will be 10 people behind them thinking, they asked me to put my reputation on the line for Owen Patterson when he was up in front of the Privilege Committee. We walked through the lobbies then and then, uh, you know, and then we were all, you know, it all went pear-shaped. And I think that the whips knew that they couldn't get this through, this amend, amended version through they've you know they've tried to push it down the road they keep hoping that something will turn up but i think he's run out of road um summer you've worked within government when you have political i was going to say schools like this it's a bit more than a school isn't it um d does it paralyze government to a certain extent uh, and this whole that mary was talking about the refugees to rwanda thing saying that well it was only announced to d distract attention from a, from party gate it 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 surely paralyzes government because every announcement is seen through the prism of the, the current scandal. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point. And actually, I worked in government at a time where we did have a lame duck prime minister in the form of Theresa May. And uh, actually, the downstream impact on that is that things do clog up in the system and your ability to do your job is severely diminished. Now, you know, in answer to the question, is he no more than a care caretaker MP? I don't think it's yeah. gotten to... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's gotten to that point yet. I think the issue is that, you know, in the way that this then um, sort of plays out with his MPs, um, they are ultimately going to decide whether he stays or not. And one of the difficulties here is that there isn't an alternative that people are really coalescing around in a serious way. Um, and if he gets over this hurdle, significant hurdle, um, it might be that he can sort of push his agenda through again. But at the moment... Um, it is looking difficult. I would just say one thing that, you know, when you're having a trade delegation and you're sort of taking your prime minister over, that does take a long time to work in, through the pipeline. This is not something that you can it's do been short term. two or three times. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. might might well be, but that just shows you that actually they've been trying to do it for a long time. I also think that on the Rwanda refugee policy, going through the motions of trying to put something like that together and then publicising it, that isn't something that you can do in a short amount of time. She had to get her permanent secretary asked for a ministerial direction, which basically means the permanent secretary is like, I'm nowhere near this when the inquiry happens into what this unworkable policy is. But that doesn't, but that doesn't mean that it's something that you're doing short term. That means that there have been a lot of discussions about it and what they require is a ministerial direction because there is a disagreement about the public accounts or the, or yeah, whether the they value delegate. for money, the workability, the Well, we may have a question on that later. I don't know if we have or not, but um, let, let's not spend too long on that. Um, Simon in Southampton, thank you very much. I think we kind of got where you were coming from, so I'm not going to go back to you. Uh, but Simon in Orpington has sent in a text question which is allied to this. How many fines is too many fines? How long before the PM becomes too much of a liability? And let's just add into that the fact that if there is going to be a privileges, privileges committee inquiry... I mean, you tell me how long those take, but it's not a matter of days, is it? So this could drag on well through the summer. And again, Graham, that that's not good for good government, is it? It, it sort of means you've almost got a government in stasis for in the next few months. Well, only if everybody, uh, as your show is currently doing, focuses entirely on it. Obviously, Mary and the Labour Party, that's all they want to talk about because they haven't got anything else. We've never they? had they a Prime Minister that's broken about, the law before they don't want to talk and about had a criminal policy. sanction. They don't want to talk about policy. They don't well, want to I talk, want to talk about, about Ukraine. COVID, they don't want to talk about... Uh, people died yesterday. Any attempt 
to change the subject, you get rudely interrupted. It gets us to show how I'm sure you'll do are. your share of rudely um, interrupting well, during the course of the hour. I'm sure I might. <laughs> Up to this point, I've been remarkably well behaved. Yeah. Uh, very well so behaved. Uh, Mary, you're always well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be a little bit naughty sometimes, <laughs> channeling my inner Matilda. Um, so, <laughs> look, um, one fine is, is too many. Lawmakers can't be lawbreakers. It is unthinkable that any other previous Prime Minister would have received a criminal penalty. It's not a speeding fine. It's a criminal sanction and would brazenly carry on in office. Anyone with an ounce of honour or an ounce of shame would have resigned by now and done the decent thing. He's kind of, uh, didn't David Cameron say he was a bit like a greased piglet and I feel like he's kind of, you know, he slips through people's hands a bit, doesn't he? He's kind of like, he always, something always turns up and he's been lucky, you know. Um, he's he's had all sorts of um, you know, m reprieves but I really think that the, the you know, the fact hope, that he Mary, could get No, I think that we will see another series of fines, perhaps more serious than the other ones, they're going to that drumbeat will start as soon as May 5th is over and I don't see how that, you know, the, the decent the vast majority of decent conservative MPs can put up with it They'll, they're going back to their constituencies they're having their local elections they'll see their conservative councillors wiped out and they'll be thinking what's this going to mean for me at the general election whenever it comes um, George Eaton, it's interesting you bring the local elections into into this. That could actually be more of a trigger than extra fines because, I mean, if the Conservatives lose a few hundred seats, they'll probably think that's quite good. But if they lose 1,500 seats and they're particularly in the red wall seats, then that becomes a big difficulty for Boris Johnson. Yes, I completely agree because... Um it said, you know, Powell said all political careers end, it, uh, end in failure, but you, ultimately all political careers end in politics. That what determines whether a politician ultimately survives, particularly a prime minister, is do their MPs get scared? Do they start fearing that they will lose their seats? And the key barometer in advance of a general election are the local elections. So if the Conservatives do lose hundreds of councillors on May the 5th, and then if they lose Wakefield... Uh, an emblematic red wall seat, that could be far more lethal for Boris Johnson among the constituency that ultimately will determine his fate, which is Conservative MPs. Salma, Conservative MPs, well, how do you read them at the moment? I mean, you know a lot of them. Yes, I think it's very difficult because there is that contingent that's always disliked Boris Johnson and will always dislike Boris Johnson. Um, and then there are, I mean, as, you, as you've, you know, uh, read out some names earlier, you know, there, there are those people who backed him and are now wavering. And there are still those people who absolutely staunchly defend him no matter what. So there are still these very distinct groups. And I don't think there are, there's and much it doesn't seem to be right. Them. It doesn't seem to be right or left, does it? No. There's a sort of smattering of, across the party mm. on either side. There, there's some of it that is kind of, you know, the self-interestedness about what happens to them in an election campaign. There's some of it that just, you know, they, like, as I say, they don't like Boris Johnson. But where is that shift going to come from? Because they seem to be very, very distinct groups. So, mm. you know, there doesn't seem to be much cross over amongst many of them at the moment. We will move on in a moment. Graham will be very relieved to hear uh, on to a different subject. So keep your calls coming. 0345 6060 973. It's quarter past eight. LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 17 minutes past eight on LBC. Uh, Salma Shah is here, political commentator. Graham Stewart, Conservative MP for Beverly and Holderness. Mary Cray, the former Labour MP for Wakefield. And George Eaton, senior editor at The New Statesman. Um, Darren in St Albans wants to know, is Salma Shah going to stand for Parliament? We need her in Westminster. Such a grounded and level-headed lady. She gets my vote. Well, if you want to stand for St Albans and win that seat back from the Lib Dems, you've got to vote at that. Thank you. That's very kind. But I don't think that's going to happen. (laughs) Right, let's go to our next question. It's from Keith in Bristol. Hello, Keith. Hello, Ian. What's your question, please? Uh, It's uh, Boris Johnson. I would grudgingly give him credit for providing weapons, etc., and assistance to the the Ukraine in their dreadful circumstances. But I feel that all this is totally negotiated, uh, negated by the appalling system which is delaying refugees from the war zone for an inordinate amount of time. Uh, there are 44... So you're, talk, you're talking about the Ukrainian refugees here? The Ukrainian refugees. Yeah. There are 44 countries in Europe. If you uh, discount Russia, Belarus and the Ukraine itself, that leaves 41. 40 of those countries don't require the onerous visa requirements that the UK does. And this is a deliberate policy of delay, which together with the uh, Rwanda situation, the Tories feel is a a vote winner. They were desperate to keep anyone out of this country. Um, Salma Shah, well, you've worked in the Home Office with Sajid Javid. Do you recognise what Keith is saying? Do you think he's right? Is that the motivation? Well, I think the first thing to say is I totally recognise where Keith is coming from because when you are looking at pictures that are coming out of Ukraine, uh, the, the first initial instinct is to want to be able to do everything that you can to help. And it is difficult when you hear stories about refugees not being able to make it uh, across uh, into our country and seek that help that they need. I think there is an element of truth to what he is saying in the sense that we have been very hardline on immigration for a very long time and for very good reason. I think there is a a bigger part of this that isn't about a deliberate policy to keep people out, but actually a system that doesn't work as well as it can and should. And I think that's very important as a, as a, as a lesson from this, is to understand actually how can we have our system and the operation at the border improve so that we aren't having these situations where desperate refugees are being turned away. We were told on this programme by the Refugees Minister, Richard Harrington, and this was at the beginning of the month, that by this time there would only be a 48-hour delay in visas being processed. Now, um, he's hopefully coming on the show the week after next to update us all on exactly where they are, but I I don't get the feeling that there's been a dramatic improvement in the way that these cases are being handled, do you? Well, I I think what they were expecting was that there was going to be an exponential rise, but, you know, I don't understand you know, what the operational blockage is to, to stop people from coming in. And I think... The well, it's the, thing- it's the visa requirement, isn't it? As Keith said, no other country is doing this. Uh, do, do you buy the argument that Priti Patel uses that um, it's all about security or do you think that's just a fake argument? No, I think there's an important element of security, but I think there are, there are ways of getting over that hurdle. Um, and that's where I think that there are, there are operational blockages and that the system can't snap into it, it to what it needs to do quickly enough um, because it, it's sort of um, the way that it's always operated is to say no. Mm. Um, and trying to be dynamic in a situation where people really need that help is very slow for the Home Office to be able to process. Okay, Mary Cray. Well, what I would say is that people <clears throat> fleeing um, violence um, anywhere in the world need safe and legal routes to apply for asylum in this country. And if you're currently somebody living in Afghanistan where, you know, the boys are being bombed in their schools, the girls are not allowed to go to school and people are selling their kidneys in order to to, to afford food for their families, um, you know, due to our precipitate withdrawal from there, what, what are people supposed to do? So... To the, to the question about Ukraine, 
Um, I think um, the Prime Minister has done good in, in a, both applying uh, and giving defensive weapons and offensive weapons to the Ukrainians, and I hope we would do a lot more. Um, and I sat on NATO's Parliamentary Assembly and there was always a, a violent outbreak of agreement with the Conservatives and the Lib Dems whenever the subject of Russia came up and the Germans were always saying we need to invite our Russian friends along and we kept saying um, they've poisoned Litvinenko and then they poisoned um, Sergei, they attempted to poison the Scripples. So, um, you know, so that there is unity in that. But to the um, the, the scheme, only, I, I think the 30,000 visas have been issued, but only 6,000 people have got here. And I don't understand why there is this delay. I don't understand why we aren't uh, allowing the people who have generously stepped up through the Homes for Ukraine scheme to uh, welcome these refugees into their homes. And um, But I do think, having said that, that the policy of allowing single women to be located in placed with single men definitely needs to be looked at again but I think the asylum system that we have in this country is in crisis I think the number of the time it takes to process applications is far too long leaves far too many people in limbo for years and it is it has gone up over the last couple of years that that time to process and if you want to process people humanely and safely why not open a processing centre in Calais in France rather than the lunacy of shipping children child refugees off to Rwanda. It's madness. I don't think that's a policy, is it? It is. They're going what, to ship children out. Children. Confirm. Yes, yes. Okay. Another reason not to like it, Graham Stewart? I, well, I don't know where uh, the source for Mary's line on that is. That's not my understanding at all. Though they were, the government has not given um, specifics as to exactly who um, and who will not uh, go to... Well, they haven't given us specifics on anything, frankly. I mean, Pretty Patel in the Commons on Tuesday didn't have any answers to any of the questions that were asked of her. Well, it's clear that anyone who uh, seeks to come to the UK illegally, and almost by definition they'll be doing so from an already safe country... They need a so safe not, and legal route. Um, well, there are safe and legal routes. We've had uh, 185,000 men, women and children um, since 2015 offered a, a refuge here. What we've seen and what... Uh, you know, which is why I think the Labour Party, as ever, is so often out of step with the, the country. We've seen it going from, was it around 300 um, people were doing the illegal crossing a few years ago up to um, 28,000 um, illegal migrants seeking to cross the channel. Um, we, with all the m human misery, suffering and death that comes with that. Just remind us who's been, in, who's, who's been in government all that time? Yeah. Well, well, the government has sought and tried to do everything possible. It's been the Conservative government, obviously, but we've done everything possible to get agreement with the EU, with France. Um, we've offered money, we've negotiated uh, in good faith, and what we have to do as a sovereign nation, if we don't, we can't force them. Uh, to uh, engage with us in the way that we'd like them to. And what we have to do is come up with a solution that stops the deaths in the channel, stops this ridiculous and unsustainable level of illegal migration. Just and now the rule is, so just to be clear, and we've had we've had attacks on Rwanda, uh, which is either, you know, basically no one knows anything, they don't know anything about the modern Rwanda. It's, it's I've been borderline, there. It's, border, it's borderline, um, you know, uh, just prejudice against Rwanda. That's rubbish. Um, they've, they, Paul they, they have made is they've no been, friend of human rights. They, they have made, they've made enormous... Can you name me any African leader that is? Yes, um, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson in Liberia. This, you know, come on, I, I just don't think we can talk about Africa as a no, continent in that I've, way, but I have but visited I, I mean, Rwanda well, I've, I've and been, Burundi I've been, and Congo. I've been to Rwanda as well. I mean, admittedly, this is back in 2007, so quite, quite some time ago. Same time, I, and, yeah. I mean, yes, of course, there, there are legitimate questions to ask about the way that the, the Rwandan government operates, but uh, yeah. Britain has been... Uh, the forefront of trying to help Rwanda become a modern day democracy and the Rwandans really appreciate that. English now is the second language and it used to be used to be French. Um, and I think Graham has a point that there's been a lot of ill-informed um, facts in inverted commas being given about Rwanda but it, it's, it's not that given its history I think we can both agree that it's actually that whatever Kagame's faults might be, he has actually brought all the different constituent parts of Rwanda together and that 
And yes, we, build it. we help them build their tax um, collection. You know, we, they it is. And this is going to put 120 million pounds in, into development in Rwanda. Yeah, but it does, it does seem odd, though, progress. Graham, that we are taking refugees from, from Rwanda at the same time. That does seem a We're little incongruous. Kagame. That's the well. There, there's, um, you know, it's always uh, complex. But what we what we have is an unsustainable level of mig illegal migration. We have an absolutely unacceptable level of uh, people um, being exploited and or killed and we have 25,000 asylum seekers currently housed in expensive hotels in because this country you're not processing and, and, their claims. and 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 the 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 and Two the labor the asylum. labor party's response saying why aren't you why aren't you what well, mary said it didn't she why don't you do this thing in calais well we can't we don't control calais and what we are what this will do is it will um, disincentivize it'll I mean, destroy the business model of these through, people it'll May save says lives. It'll increase trafficking of women it'll, and girls through appalling chairmanship on my part i've allowed this discussion to drift off onto rwanda rather than what keith what Ke well it has been interesting what, what keith asked about so george get us back on track in terms of um keith is basically saying that any credit the government deserves from the military side of ukraine is negated by the fact that the refugee issue has been handled disastrously I agree with that. I think um, it's it's a stain on the UK's reputation. And what the government should have done is what so many of our European uh, partners did, which is uh, allow visa-free travel. The reason they didn't do that is because they're terrified of uh, Nigel Farage. And they believe the reason people voted for Brexit was concerns over high immigration. And uh, they put politics uh, before ethics. Uh, but I actually think... They're wrong, not just from a moral perspective, but from pol a political perspective. You look at public opinion, they're hugely supportive of taking refugees. And you see that from the number who have applied to take Ukrainians into their own homes. But more broadly, I think attitudes towards immigration have shifted significantly since 2016. Um, and yes, some of those uh, coming will be uh, primarily economic migrants. But actually, this country needs uh, economic migrants uh, in, an, in an aging population. Um, someone is correcting you, Mary, mm. but they may be incorrect. I don't know. Uh, the former footballer, George Weir, is the current president of Liberia. We should check this during well, it's the break. It's entirely possible, but when you, you <laughs> asked about, you know, corruption free, uh, she's, she stood down. She's the rare beast in Africa that she actually stood down when her allotted time was over and had elections and allowed somebody else to become well recovered, president. Mary. No, no, I was, you know. I was impressed by your ability to answer his question in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, talking of um, uh, standing down and whatever, you were defeated in the last general election in Wakefield, and well, of course, political careers end in failure, well, as George said. As I, as I well know, <laughs> it's Enoch said, wasn't it? Uh, now, uh, I noticed she referred to him by his first name there. Um, you are not going to put your name forward for the Wakefield by-election, even though that was your former constituency. Was that yeah. that must have been a very difficult? What do you know decision? that we don't know? <laughs> no, nothing. No, no. Do you think I, the Tories are going to walk it? No, I don't. What I want to yeah. know is why Zimran Ahmed Khan said he's he's resigning instantly and then not actually written the letter. So the Conservatives cannot move the writ to have the by-election. It seems to me that he's well, said that to get if, the heat. If off. you were Boris Johnson, would you want a by-election at the moment? I think I mean, the rule politics of this is they will delay it as long as they can. I wondered, I wonder, there's there's two schools of thought, isn't there? Get it out of the way, rip off the plaster, get it over with and, and bury it. Um, I, my understanding is that um, the Conservatives have already closed nominations for the um, candidacy in Wakefield and there's been... Well, nicely deflected, but we want to know why you're not standing, Mary. Well, that's... <laughs> I, I, I want to know who your candidate is, but leaving all that aside... Um, well, might I that did, make you change your mind? I did, yeah, I know. <laughs> It's been so. It's been really hard. I, I can announce on the program tonight, Mary, that I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I was. I'd always said that I wouldn't stand again, and I'd in, in my head, and I'd I'd said to that to the people that that I'm close to in the constituency. But of course, um, when. I saw the case and when I, you know, it was it was appalling. And of course, I've had people writing to me, asking me for help with the DVLA, uh, for help with their brother who's in prison. You know, people keep writing to you. They don't kind of understand mm. that you're now a private citizen. And I had lots and lots of letters. And it, it, so there was a huge emotional pull. And there's a part of my heart that will, will sort of forever be Wakefield. But at the end of the day... Um, 
I, I just felt that it would be going backwards, not forwards. And I thought, I also think it's going to be a really, really, really tough fight. Um, and um, I've been at home with my children for the last two and a half years, and I've really enjoyed that. And I was going to say, I, that, that would ready. have made me want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I, haven't, my kids, I haven't met your children. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, teenagers, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. They're in their bedrooms the whole time. I didn't see them for, for you know, the first sort of 16 years. So now it's like, oh, I've got these people that I live with. So, um, so you'll be supporting Ed Balls? Well, um... <laughs> I wonder, I wonder. I mean, I think I think Ed has a great new career um, as a sort of TV personality. Um, you know, he's he's the sort of darling of the nation. And... Um, I'd have thought. Yeah. I'd have thought, yeah, I know, <laughs> Gangnam style. Um, so I, I don't know who, who is going no. to... I think the field is pretty wide okay. open, so... Right, we'll take more of your calls in just a moment on LBC. You're listening to Ian Dale on Cross Question and the news headlines at 8.33 with Lottie Morley. MPs have voted to refer Boris Johnson to the Privileges Committee to be investigated for claims he lied to Parliament. The Prime Minister has denied misleading the Commons over gatherings in Downing Street during lockdown. A man's been found guilty of murdering a six-year-old boy almost 30 years ago. James Watson was 13 when he killed schoolboy Ricky Neve in 1994, leaving his body in Woodland in Peterborough. And the US President has announced a further $800 million worth of military aid for Ukraine. Russia has claimed victory in the fight for the port city of Mariupol, despite cancelling plans to storm a steel plant where Ukrainian civilians are trapped. LBC weather, dry for many tonight, some patchy light rain in parts of England and a low of two degrees. LBC. A Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.36. With us on the panel tonight are Salma Shah, the political commentator, former special advisor to Sajid Javid. Graham Stewart is Conservative MP for Beverley and Holderness. Mary Cray, former Labour MP for Wakefield and not future MP for Wakefield, it seems. And George Eaton, senior editor at the New Statesman. All right, text question from Nikki in Dorchester. Why are we still giving money to India in foreign aid when they've been doing business with Russia? Mary. 
Well, that was one of the questions the Conservatives were asking in 2010. Why are we giving um, foreign aid money to India and China? And the answer that I gave then is the same answer that I'll give now, which is it has a huge number of people who are living in absolute poverty and um, that the UK's um, aid work in India is very important. We have well-established aid uh, there and we're particularly good on um, issues around children and particularly around girl children and there's a huge amount of um, child slavery and bonded labour in India as well. So um, I, I think we have to um, separate out that part of what we're doing for the poorest people in India who've got n no idea what India's doing. But I can hear listeners screaming at their radios as you say that, saying, yes, but they're spending hundreds of millions on a space programme. Yes, um, as as is every country that wants its own satellite technology and doesn't want to be reliant on a foreign power. I mean, India has a long post-colonial history of neutrality, hence the, what I think is frankly, a too close relationship uh, to Russia. They have been noticeable in their silence around Russia's aggression in Ukraine. But I think that is a separate issue. Well, not only that, Modi went and paid a visit to Putin, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, China, though, is a different kettle of fish nowadays, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. So you, think you don't much, think we should be... Yeah, getting... I mean, I think that has that's moved on mm. so much now. Okay. Sam Shah. I think morally there's always an obligation for uh, developed countries such as ours to uh, look at what's happening in other countries, especially in relation to uh, issues of poverty, and support that. I, you know, there's always that part of you that thinks that your foreign um, development money should be linked to your foreign policy in some way. I think people miss the fact that aid also acts as a soft power. And even if India has a satellite program, the, the difficulty for us is that's more money that's not going towards, you know, alleviating poverty in that country. And our obligation to those people morally should stand. I think the China situation, you know, is is different, but it's also difficult because, again, it's that soft power. You know, we want people in these other countries to think of Britain in a friendly way. And we shouldn't just move away from it because that is part of, I think, you know, what global Britain is, is supposed to be about. But in terms of foreign policy, um, Modi is clearly, um, I think Mary, and I'm sure Graham would agree, it, it seems to be quite close to Russia. Um, do you think it's right that Western countries should ever say, well, we will continue with the aid, but you need to alter your, your views on this policy, that policy or another policy? Uh, I absolutely think that that is something that Western powers uh, should be able to say. And I think it was uh, very true when Imran Khan went to the UN and started, uh, you know, criticising Western powers for asking him for things. You know, we are supporting those economies. Mm. Um, I think there are other ways in, alongside aid, um, you know, in other policies, whether it's kind of immigration policies, whether it's visa policy, things like that, that we should also leverage when we're talking to these countries. George Eaton. I agree with Mary that the aid is not for India, it's for the poor, poorest people in India. I mean, here's an analogy. You know, London is one of the richest cities in the world, but it also contains uh, some of the poorest people in the UK um, who charities rightly support. On aid, I think the UK had a deserved reputation as, a, as, as an aid superpower. Uh, and I think it's a great uh, shame that the Department of International Development was scrapped. I would, I, I think that should be reopened as part of um, Britain uh, using aid as as a, as a form of soft power as well. Is that Labour Party policy, Mary? Do you know to, to recreate the diffid? Well, I think I, I think I disagree with Salman because I don't think that aid should be linked to your foreign policy objectives. I think you should, we had a very we we gave we we moved it out of the Foreign Office and the Conservatives have now moved it back in. I think that's a strategic mistake. I, I was very concerned when I mean one of the reasons that 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 Priti Patel can go to Rwanda ironically and ask them to take our refugees is because of our long history of aid to that country, a country where we were not the colonial power, um, where, you know, we had nothing to do with it, but we went in post-genocide and said, we will help you to rebuild. So, you know, aid, you cannot, if you're a conservative, you would argue that that has actually uh, delivered this very close relationship, this close political relationship over the years. I don't know what the Labour Party's policy is. 
I prefer to see it separated out. And I think the other thing that we need to look at when we're looking at um, aid is also to look at 10 years ahead and think what is going to be the climate consequence of, you know, where is Bangladesh going to be? How much of Bangladesh is going to be underwater? Um, how much of China is going to be underwater? You know, as the sea levels can continue their mm-hmm. export, how much is going to be, how much food is going to be grown in sub-Saharan Africa? These are all things that we need to be planning for now. Let's just remind us of Nikki's question. Why are we still giving money to India in foreign aid when they've been doing business with Russia, Graham? Uh, well, we don't link aid to their uh, political stance. We do focus on deprivation and development uh, and the like. Uh, in terms of picking up the, the issue about engagement with India, because the Prime Minister's there right now, of course, and is and we are pursuing um, ambitious uh, trade in pursuit of an ambitious trade deal with India, not an easy country to do a trade deal with, and I say that as a, someone who was a trade minister for three and a half years, um, but actually engaging with India is what we need to do. Imagine what we don't want is the historic links between India and Russia, the arms supply and all the rest of it for this incredible um, and fast economically growing democracy. We do not want India in the decades to come to be staying in the same orbit, the same axis that it's been in before. And you're not going to do that either by, I slightly disagree with some, I don't think it is right um, to start going into a proud and independent and democratic nation like India and start to tell them, you know, be uh, be too sharp about we're not going to give you any aid if you don't do what we want. I think we have to engage with them as an equal partner and we have to build uh, relationships in security and various other areas and economically so that they move um, and they move into where we need India to be because you know at the moment we have increasingly self-confident uh, autocrats don't we I mean they, they move from being slightly apologetic pretending they're democratic when they're not to actually now I mean you look at Putin when he was first um, first became president and he talked about how they were yes but Graham this is, and now, this is and the now they're going point. the other way this is the entire point We have so little in terms of leverage. You know, any Western liberal democracy has so little in terms of leverage in the way that we believe in things. But if we are going to stand for anything, and if we believe in in what we purport to believe in, which is freedom and democracy, then we have to use what we have because we are entering a world where autocrats are taking over. And we seem to be, you know, like the Germans and the French, taking a leave of our senses and taking a, a, a back seat in, in terms of pushing that agenda. And I think... Okay, you know, I, I do, if, if, I do you, agree with you, sir. That we, I mean, I, I, as, I, as I say, as a trade minister, I would look at... I, I, um, when I saw um, DFID, which... I felt too often acted as if it was some at some sort of level well above the UK. Um, had nothing to do with the UK. Now, I, you don't need to be a believer in tide aid where everything's conditional for a UK benefit, immediate UK benefit, to believe that actually spending tax by my constituents, hard-earned money, people on low wages in, in East Yorkshire, um, paying for that, it's one of the most frequent things people will raise with me at a street surgery and come up and go, why aren't you doing that? So they do want to know that our aid actually serves our long-term interest as well as doing the right thing and we shouldn't I do agree with you that we should use what uh, leverage we've got and look for leverage but it's just uh, it's doing it in the right way and I'm not sure uh, no, it's not about being harsh but it's about saying that actually you know if you want to benefit from what Western liberal democracies have to offer that there is a, a way that you actually have to seriously engage with us and you can't play us off when you're wanting to talk to the Russians as at the same time as taking uh, the benefit that you can from the UK. OK, we are going to move on. We had a good discussion on that. Um, lots more to come. It's 8.45. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. A new natural history GCSE. Education Secretary Nadim Zahawi, if it's that important, why is it taking three and a half years? The work that we need to do to make sure we get the actual content right, working with Cambridge, uh, working with off well, can I put yep. it to you? It's nice yep. to have your picture taken with Bear Grylls. It's all in keeping yes. with climate change. And if you cared yes. this much, it would be on the syllabus yes. this September, wouldn't it? By the time we actually get the content right and then roll it out, we'll try and do it as quickly as we can. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.49 on LBC. Salma Shah, Graham Stewart, Mary Cray and George Eaton with us taking your calls. Uh, Chris in Croydon has got a good question, if slightly niche, I suppose, but it's a good one, I think. Hello, Chris. Oh, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Go ahead. Well, this, my question is this. Who has done more for tertiary education, Tony Blair or his son, Ewan? Now, people who've been listening to this programme for some time may remember that Ewan Blair did a, ph- a phone-in with me on apprenticeships. And I think that w- wasn't long after he'd formed his company, and it's been a huge success in providing or, or matching people with apprenticeships. Um, and, and this has been one of the... Tertiary education, I think, has, over the years, been one of those sectors which successive governments haven't really taken seriously enough. Um Graham Stewart. Uh, well, yes, I mean, this focus on apprenticeships, it's been one of the successes of um, the government since 2010 to get many more people into apprenticeships. So it's a bit of a dip with the levy. But I think uh, uh, making sure that the, what I always call the other 50%, which I remember, I remember once talking about that when I was chairing the Education Committee to Ed Miliband and was then horrified when he used it in his conference speech. I was like, oops, I mustn't, I mustn't claim any authorship for that. He probably deny it. It had anything to do with me anyway. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, I mean, I, I did chair the Education Committee and we've always been great at educating elite. We're, you know, everyone, everyone obsesses about oh, bright working class kids. Well, I'll tell you what happens to bright working class kids. Generally, they do fine. They do well. Maybe they don't become a high court judge, but they have a good life and a good job. It's people who aren't naturally that academic but have all sorts of talents um, and getting a system that serves them it's it's uh, people understand you know newspapers w- uh, will never write about it typically you know whereas if somebody slags off an Oxford college is guaranteed front page it'll be on your show and all the rest of it so you uh, and Blair has gone into an area and has trying to use technology as I understand it I'm not an expert on the business but they are, I know um, just because of family connections there how thorough they are and that seems to be a really serious enterprise and it's a of course, a serious commercial success so far. I believe on his last funding round, he, his um, his share from memory was something like 160 million, making him three times wealthier than his uh, overly acquisitive father. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I think uh, you know. Um, anyway, my vote would go for him, and I, I haven't met him personally, but I'm told by people who have that he's actually deeply he's impressive, very, very impressive, um, thoughtful, guy. and he's in exactly the right area, trying to uh, bring new ideas and deliver very high quality education where it's most needed, rather than worrying about who gets A-levels and which university they get. See, interestingly, Peter's got to the nub of the issue. He says, what does tertiary education mean? You see, when you have to define that to somebody, I mean, Pete won't be the only one that uh, doesn't uh, know that. Well, I was sitting here thinking, and I chaired the Education Committee for five years, and I I thought tertiary education covered a whole um, breadth of things. I don't think it meant what you took it to mean. I don't think it, uh, unless I'm wrong. But it's I, education after school. It is after yeah. school. It's, yeah. So it's everything. College, so it's it's not actually about technical and vocational. TVET would be the... Um, the, the uh, okay. Uh, Salma. Area. Well, actually, I, I did a bit of uh, apprenticeship policy when I was in the business department. And, you get uh, around, don't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's how job got around. <laughs> um, I have to say, I, in answer to the question, I think it's a continuation. You know, there isn't one that did more than the other. I think it is, you know, the fact that uh, you know, I managed to go to universities from a working class background uh, as a consequence of uh, the Tony. policy. And uh, I think, you know, with technology changing and with our requirements of what we need in the economy in terms of skills developing and changing, this has also um, filled a gap in the market. So actually, I think it's a complete sensible continuation of, you know, understanding that you need to upskill people and New Labour did that by trying to send more people to university, something that I think, you know, the last three Conservative administrations have have also um, done. Um, and then actually making apprenticeships particularly a lot more enticing to people because it is about high value and high skill. And the idea that apprenticeships are just something that you go and do to do kind of a low skill job, you know, isn't mm. true anymore. Um, you know, it's degree equivalent. Um, and so being able to have that technology that matches people up and gives you that personalised service is is that continuation in education that I don't think we've ever seen okay. before. George? The answer as of today would be that... Tony Blair has done more, but it's not a like-for-like comparison. Mm. He had 10 years in government. And uh, Labour did dramatically increase uh, the university population. 
uh, and dramatically increased funding, even if you take into account, obviously, the introduction of tuition fees. Uh, I think it was a mistake for fees to then be tripled to, to 9,000 and for the share the of public funding. Yes. Uh, the share of public funding to be massively reduced, but um, Ewan may yet uh, end up doing more. Uh, let's 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 look at uh, how where Ewan stands after after he's had ten years. Maybe Wakefield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're both policy entrepreneurs, aren't they? So Tony Tony made education, education, education the bedrock of what New Labour was all about, and and I think the principle that every person should have the ability to get on and fulfil their talents and meet their aspirations and have a decent life and a decent home, it, it, that's the bedrock of of everything that we stand for in a developed Western country. And I think looking now to other countries like Singapore and Japan, the knowledge economies that we're going to be in competition with in the future, Tony's right to say we need seventy percent graduate because 70%. He's, but he's talking about people under the age of 30 so he's talking about the people that go off work in a business and then suddenly in their mid-20s need a management qualification need a technical or vocational qualification need to understand data need to understand how to run the finances these are all really important higher education qualifications tertiary qualifications and what's happened sadly over the last 10 years and, and this has been documented well by the education select committee is that we've got these missing learners which are the post-25 learners they've the got an excellent learners. new chairman by the way I think. <laughs> yeah. but they've They've, disapp they've disappeared and that, that's because the funding for further education has been strangled so much. So I think that the, the policy, both people are right on the policy. You know, one was right for sort of 15, 20 years ago, one is right for now. But what Ewan has tapped into is a bunch of young people who are saying, I'm not spending nine grand a year getting into debt. I'm not going to graduate with 50 grand of debt and then be charged... 10% uh, interest on it from the day I the day I acquire it. This is the you know the one guyization of, of of tuition fees is what's happening under the mm, Conservatives. It's it, okay. It's like there's it, no okay. other uh, no, 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 we're not going to get into that because we've only got a few minutes left, and I want to get to the next years. question. Peter in Norwich has sent it by text. He says Jeremy Corbyn says he want NATO, wants NATO disbanded. How are so many people still in love with this guy, George Eaton? Well, I think the honest answer to that is not that many people are in love with him if you look at the polls. Um, did you support Labour at the last election with him as the leader? We, we The New States did not endorse Labour at the last election, actually. Um, and it's worth saying, obviously, as leader, he was pragmatic enough that Labour didn't oppose uh, NATO membership. Um, and he, he was pragmatic enough to recognise, I think, that if he had opposed... NATO membership, then um, he wouldn't have got he into faced, power. But he'd he would have faced tried, the, he'd have tried to get out if he had got into power. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that he's said this this week, I mean, shows a political naivety, doesn't yeah. it? Because if he wants to get back into the PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party, um, you wouldn't say things like that, would yes, you? Yes. Well, I think it's, he's 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 made his choice. I think it's quite possible he'll stand as an independent or or mm. for a new party in 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 Islington North. Not in my hands with glee at that one, <laughs> uh, Graham Stewart. <laughs> Um, uh, on Corbyn, well, it's, I mean, obviously there are many Corbynites in the modern um, parliamentary Labour Party now, uh, and that's, he poured a lot of poison deep into the roots of the party, and that's going to be, you know, if uh, uh, we start talking about policy instead of just party gate relentlessly, I think we'll have a, a proper opportunity to work out what a Labour government would actually mean and uh, and how what this dysfunctional Labour Party would be like running the country. Um, Salma? I think Jeremy Corbyn is a classic example of a politician that gives easy answers and for people looking for easy answers are willing to follow him. And the reality is it's much more complex than that. And I think with why certain people are still in love with him, it's because they think life is simple and it's not. Mary, you're a massive Corbyn fan. You must love these words. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very proud that the Labour Party set up and established NATO in the wake of World War II. Um, as I said, I was on the NATO Parliamentary Assembly um, for, I think, a, a total of seven years uh, during my parliamentary career. Uh, so let me tell you that um, there was absolutely no chance of me supporting any moves to withdraw from NATO. Um, I think that what he said about, you know, his failure to support Zelensky is deeply problematic. 
But I disagree with Graham. Um, you know, the people who flirted with supporting the stop the war nonsense at the start of this, um, of the Ukrainian, uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, were given very short shrift by Keir Starmer and were left in no uncertain terms of what would happen to the whip if they, um, uh, you know, flirted with any of that daft uh, idiocy. But they're still there. And they all fell into line. They all fell and into line. They all, line. Line. They all mm. will vote well, you have to, give to support credit. NATO. You have to give credit so, for that. Under new management is is where the Labour Party is, and long may it remain so. Right, our final text question from Carol in Bristol. As Big Brother is reported to be returning on ITV2 next year, I wonder if my agent knows about that, would any of, <laughs> would any of the panel appear on it or any other reality TV show? Well, Mary, you've got a few hours to spare now. You're not an MP. <laughs> I've been scarred by George Galloway, uh, dressed as a cat, licking milk from Rula Lenska's hands, which has stayed with me forever. Not least because Steve Pound then imitated him in a, body, a red one oh, bodysuit. It was, yeah, really? I, it was famous um, in some variety show afterwards. And, and hasn't um, Nadine Doris been on it as she, well? She ate kangaroo anus. Yeah, well, literally. Literally, she's wild horses. Yeah. I know. It's, this is it's what you have to do, Graham, to get another cabinet. Galloway? That's where I went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so would you appear... I mean, if, if you got an invitation from any of these shows, would you consider I them? I don't watch them. And, I mean, I don't want to eat anything... You know, I don't want to eat anything weird like that. Um, in the olden days, didn't you just go to a house and you all chatted together? Now it's all weird. Or is that an I'm a celebrity thing? I think it's all a bit weird. Graham? Not my... Not well, my I think party. I want to see George and Selma and, and I think Mary should go for it. In, in fact, all four of you um, to, in order to, you know, get up even higher profile in your case, Ian, and then, um, and then launch yourselves into Parliament. But no, I don't think I'll be going on any of them. George? Probably won't be. No, I had enough of being locked in a house during COVID yeah. and uh, <laughs> I don't think the ratings would be high enough, certainly compared <laughs> to uh, shows such as this. Selma? Oh, well, I want to talk to your agent and see what the fee looks like because I've got a mortgage, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> never say never. I'll, I'll get my people to talk to your people. Thank you very much, all four of you, for joining us tonight on Cross Question. Graeme Stewart, Mary Cray, Salma Shah and George Eaton. Coming up in a moment, the Education Secretary, Nadine Zahawi, has rejected calls for a ban on parents smacking children in England, revealing that his wife has occasionally given their daughter a light smack on the arm. Well, the Dean will be joining us on the programme on Tuesday for an hour at seven. You might want to ask him about that, but I'm interested in your views on this, because whenever I start phone-ins on smacking, I automatically start by saying that it's ridiculous to ban it. And then by the end of the hour, I, I've kind of You're changed my mind. Yeah. So let's see if that happens again today, shall we? Uh, <laughs> you can give me a call, 0345 6060 973. And Barry says, Ian, who needs TV when you have LBC? That's going to be our new advertising slogan. And it's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. Boris Johnson is facing another investigation over claims he lied to Parliament about parties in Downing Street. MPs have backed a Labour motion to refer the Prime Minister to the Privileges